internets back at it with another podcast sultans and sneakers i'm your host as always maheen the podcaster and today i am pleased to be joined by pastor joe wyrostic did i get that right yes sir Wyrostic. <laughs> and jose riesco the third representing metro praise international on the uh, north side of chicago logan square neighborhood right um and you know why are we talking here today? The listeners will know that there was a situation that we discussed about a couple of months ago with one of my favorite restaurants that no longer exists called Nini's Deli. And Joe and Jose had the unique perspective of being um, the church that Juan, the owner of Nini's, uh, attends. And Jose is actually his older brother. So um, you were at the forefront that final day. Um, so definitely want to get your guys' take on like what happened. So starting off, um, you know, in, either one of you guys can take this. When did you guys first get wind or um, of that something was going on with Nini's Deli? Is it okay if I go first, Jose? Sure. A actually, you know what? Be yeah, yeah. I, 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 I did want to also ask you guys a little bit about your church and whatnot, but you, you can talk about Nini's first and we, I'll, I'll get to your, because I'd like to have the listeners also understand what the framework is. Sure. You know what? Start start with that. Tell Pastor Joe. Why don't you explain to the listeners, Metro Praise, um, what you, like who you guys are as a church? I understand from what I read online is that you're a non-denominational Pentecostal church, right? Um, for someone who's completely like ignorant of the Christian faith or denominations, or you know, can you explain a little bit what that means? Wonderful. Yes. And assalamu alaikum, Mahin, to your uh, Sultan and Sneakers fans. Yeah. God bless you. It's an honor to be here. We're grateful for the opportunity to share from our perspective. We felt that out of all the media outlets covering it, that you actually were probably the most fair. That doesn't mean we agree on everything. I just felt like you were the most fair. So I just want to appreciate that. Alhamdulillah, we praise God for giving you at least the wisdom and kindness to be gracious and treating others as you would want to be treated. So we are a non-denominational church. What that simply means is we are not in a denomination. That doesn't mean that we make up our own rules and do our own things. We're a church that abides by what many denominations abide by. An example one would be the Assemblies of God, Church of God in Christ, Church of God. So we fall into the branch of Protestantism, which means we uh, believe that we should have broke away from the Roman Catholic Church because of their errors. And then we follow under, uh, fall underneath Protestantism, Pentecostalism, which means we believe the gifts of the Spirit that were poured out on the day of Pentecost on the Christians are still with us today. So very simply, we believe the Bible, and we believe that the Holy Spirit is doing great things today. My wife and I started it over a decade ago, and we've always had a heart for the city. I'm originally from Fort Wayne, Indiana. She was uh, born and raised here, went to Taft High School. But when we started the church, we wanted to be in the urban area. We wanted to be where everything was going down. So we picked a place like um, Belmont Cragen area. I uh, also have worked quite a bit on the west side in Chicago and uh, Division or Chicago and Cicero and Division area, which would be known as Ohio Park. And so our church basically holds the main tenets of Christianity. But what makes us unique is that we do believe in the actual um, following of the commands of Jesus. So we believe in going out and preaching and teaching as Jesus did. We believe in making disciples, followers. This would be very important to us. So we're an active church. So we're in the community constantly. So uh, I don't know if that answers your questions, but that's a good foundation, I think. Sure. If have Absolutely. Is, is the activism, the preaching, the ministry, is that part of your own philosophy as a church or is that part of being uh, Pentecostal? Uh, that's great. It's actually a, a part of Christianity and our branch of it, Pentecostals, are one of the few that continue to keep it as uh, strong in the forefront. So in Matthew chapter 28, 19 and onward, Jesus said, go into all the world, make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teach them to obey everything I commanded, and I'm with you to the end of the age. Uh, our branch takes that very serious. Uh, since the 1900s, when our branch started, we've grown faster than any major religion. There's almost uh, 700 million now Pentecostal followers around the world, and uh, predominantly in Latin American countries, Asian countries, and African countries. So it started here, 
and now it's branched out and it's getting close to a billion. It's a very fast growing movement. Yeah, and real quick for the listeners again, the day, can you explain the day of Pentecost? I, I think I briefly read about it. It's in the, the book of Acts. Is that, is that where the disciples received the Holy Spirit? Yep. Yeah, so the Jewish people had festivals. Christians believe those festivals are now fulfilled in Christ, the Messiah. And on that specific festival, they would celebrate uh, harvest. 50 penti is what the word means. Pentecost comes 50 days after Passover. So it was a celebration of harvest. On that day in our New Testament, Jesus poured out the Holy Spirit on the disciples. They spoke in other tongues. This is, you know, some of the odd beliefs that we would have compared to other Christians, but it's right there in the Bible. They spoke in other tongues. They did miracles. And then the church began to start. So when people, uh, just to pause here, call us a cult because we speak in tongues. We believe in miracles, exorcisms, casting out of the spirits. This is actually clear in our scriptures, uh, as opposed to others believing it's not for today, we actually believe it is. Some would say it's abrogated, so to use a term you might be familiar with as a Muslim, we believe it's current for today. Gotcha. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right. Well, l- let's start off with then what happened at Nini's. Like, when did, because I'll tell you from my vantage point, um, there was Blackout Tuesday, and then I would see some comments pop up on Instagram that Wani would talk about, like, people wanting to all of a sudden wonder why does this restaurant of so much influence not speaking sing anything in light of what happened to george floyd kind of thing right but uh, 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 hey pass it up back to you guys like when did you guys first get wind that something was going on yeah if i could just summarize because i watched both of your shows where you yeah. talked about this right um can i take like three minutes and then i think i can summarize sure okay cool so Wednesday afternoon, Juan calls me up, and the first thing he says to me is, I believe God is calling me into full-time ministry. So I go, why? What's going on? He goes, they're now attacking the Christian faith because of BLM. So my first literal phone call in this situation is Juan already, in his mind, understanding where this is going to end. So I think that's very important because I was listening to a your discussion with the reporter or the guy who wrote the blog and and other things. And there's this kind of understanding like Juan and others were always trying to catch up to what was going on. I'm not saying that he understood how severe it was going to get for his family, but there was like a premonition at the beginning of what he felt this meant because he knew that this had never been fully discussed and now he felt he needed to discuss it. So I say to him, well, and this is what's funny, because people think I destroy the business when I get involved or Jose destroys it. But what people don't understand behind the scenes is we're actually trying to help him in one sense. So I said, don't give up on it. You know, give it a shot. So I'm actually the one saying, write the apology post or write the clarification post, the second one. And he was almost opposed to that at that time. He wanted to let everything uh, basically be brought to the forefront and then see what's left over. And so when we <laughs> try to talk him into doing that, he all, always made his own decisions. If you know that about Juan, he makes his own decisions. He then made his own decision. Okay, I'm gonna make a follow-up post, but I'm gonna do it in a way that represents me. So he puts it back out there and instantly the negativity comes again. And so then he deletes it and he says, what should I do? I'm ready to, go be a missionary. I'm ready to go preach the gospel. Uh, Should I even open? These are questions he's coming to me with as a pastor. And I'm like, brother, yeah, go ahead and open. And he said, well, if I'm going to open, I want preaching in front of my business. So when you think of Jose, like people think of Jose Rooney Juan, Juan's the one actually going, well, if I'm going to do it, I'm going to bring my brother in. So his brother lays down his reputation to come preach in front of the store based on Juan's request. So this is not like Jose smuggling himself into Jose, uh, and this is not Jose smuggling himself into Juan's store to try to preach or me smuggling myself, myself into this. This is basically Juan saying, I want everyone to hear this as clear as possible. And so when everything started going wrong around Thursday, after, and they were preaching Thursday as well, Thursday night when I saw the church was getting drugged into it and everything, that's when I said, let's just go live. Let's get all the haters in one spot and then try to answer the questions of people like yourself who have sincere questions. But that just turned into just, you know, basically a poop show. That just went everywhere. No one wanted to have real discussion like we're doing now. I try to bring people on live. They're doing pornography. 
So then basically Jose says, uh, I mean, Juan says to Jose, let's go at it again tomorrow, but I think it's going to be a lot more intense. So bring more preachers. And then that's where Friday just develops into what it became. And then the death threats and all of that came. And then the threats towards our building to burn it down, which we did not make ourselves. People can make themselves look bad on their own. They don't need our help. So we just had to then shut down the church publicly on a Sunday to figure out what's going on. And they had to leave the city. So from start to finish, I think Juan really wanted to think the best of people, to give them the best uh, shot at knowing what Christianity was, how he had been exposed to it, the kind of preaching that he had welcomed into his life. But they took it out of context. They blew it up. They made it something that it wasn't. And now I would speak to everyone like yourself, Mahin. I think they should be more ashamed of BLM, what BLM is doing, than what we did. Because when we get into this, my question will be to you, to anybody, tell us the worst thing Juan did. The worst thing he did was really nothing. He had beliefs, and they made it into such a big deal. And some people say, well, Jose shouldn't have preached, and this, this, and that. Dude, get over it. People preach. You disagree with them. You can still get an empanada. You can still get a whatever. But sure, sure, I'm absolutely. Too long. That's how I would summarize. Yeah, ho, ho, Jose, Jose, do you have any – I want to get your take on it. Like, when did you – when did – you first start realizing that something was going on with Nini's. Yeah, I knew something was going on when I saw his post. I didn't know at that time how, um, how vulgar it was getting with the death threats and the talking trash to my brother. And it kind of just happened so fast. And then Thursday we're in a meeting and Pastor Joe uh, puts the live stream that he was talking about. I'm like, Oh man, this is, this was serious, more serious than I thought. And then we were up late with that. And then, the next morning, you know, I hear from Pastor Joe, let's go support your brother. Okay, hey, man. And I was there earlier than uh, earlier than my brother. And I can assure you that my brother's heart, my heart, my pastor's heart was, we want to see everyone there become a Christian. Paul says that. My, I want the, everyone here to be a Christian except for my chains because he's in chains at that time. So that was what our heart was. We didn't uh, want a riot or protest or violence in any way, any vulgarity, anything of those sorts. So when I got there and I told my brother, man, it doesn't even look that bad. There's no one here. You know, I was actually working, helping him out. And then he says to go outside and preach. So like Joe said, he was the one that uh, well, I didn't impose myself on him. And then he said, go ahead, go out there and preach. I'm like, okay, let's do it, bro. So I kind of just went with it, just listening to my pastor Juan and saw, I, I knew something was up that I did not know it was going to be like that. And that's definitely not what we wanted. If you watch the video, uh, I was preaching and a young man, David, gives his life to Jesus, converts to Christianity. And that's what I thought was going to happen the whole day. So I was excited. I'm like, man, this is going to be a great day. A lot of people are going to become Christians. Mm -hmm. And it really went from, you know, uh, we call it from a revival to a riot. So Right, right. No, I I watched your and uh, Juan's interview. Um, I think you posted on your Facebook page this week, right? Mm -hmm. Um, So, yeah, that definitely clarified. You know, because there's this perception out there that, like, uh, people – and no one's spoken, like – out of pe- like people are coming to me, especially um, like m- my Muslim friends who used to go to Nini's. I don't think many of them have spoken to Juan or they've stopped unfollowing him on Facebook. So they're asking me, "Hey, are you in touch with Juan? Are you in touch with Juan?" Mm-hmm. And that and one of the speculations that are coming is that like, oh, we think there's a rift between the brothers because Jose destroyed the business. And I'm like, no, I I, I think that's selling Juan a little bit short, to be honest, because <laughs> just the, if you just look even without talking to anybody, just look at the just look at what happened. You were out there on a Friday and you, now Joe said you were out on Thursday as well, obviously with your brother's consent, right? Um, this isn't like happening. Like, it's not like you're just like showing up there and he's like, Hey man, Hey bro, get off my property. Right. Um, so like, you know, so, so some of this is just common sense kind of thing. It's like, you know, um, it, it, it would be hard for me to like, like certainly I, I I would have to assume there's gotta be a little bit of pain. There's like something about losing a business that is still like, even though if you believe it's the right thing to do long term, um, I would have, like my assumption would be he may have felt hurt. It was something he built up. Like there was like some pain about or also the idea that people that who are frequent patrons kind of turning on him in a way, right? People he I don't know how long he's known some of these guys, right? Five, six, seven years. Um you know, and then them turning, I, I mean, it's human nature to feel like, man, these, these guys, you know, you kind of feel like, and I could, I could feel the sadness in his voice, but at the same time, um, 
you guys being Christians have this worldview that like, listen, we are not going to sacrifice um, the material like our hereafter, right? You know, which is forever for um, this material world, right? You know, um, so so I, so I think that that's where people got mixed up a bit. Um, yo, um, I will. I wanted to get your take, Jose, on the style of preaching, and maybe Joe can talk about this too, because one of the um, issues people seem to have is um, that they point to is like, well, you're so in the face, right? Um, in a, in a way, right? People like because if people want to stereotype the Christian preacher, they might point to someone like yourself, right? Um, and Joe was talking earlier, like that's kind of, you guys are one of the few groups out there in modern Christianity still like doing that kind of preaching. Um, wh what goes in, wh when you're engaging with somebody, um, what's the methodology? How, like, can you break that down a little bit? Like someone, so you're, you're, you're on the street and you somebody approaches you on the street or you, you, you stop them and you start, what's the, like, how does that work psychologically? We're, we're, like, I just want to get your, your frame of mind just to understand how you're communicating the, the, uh, the gospel. Oh, thanks for the question, man. That's a great question. Well, the Bible says to become all things to all people. So for the first man I talked to, if you watch the video, David, he was humble. He was listening. We were talking back and forth. Mm -hmm. Um, it wasn't quote unquote in the face, the way people were getting upset about, although that's not wrong. Um, and it was like the Bible says to the humble, um, to the humble, God gives grace, but to the proud, God opposes. So that man was more humble. He was willing to talk and I led him to Christ. And if you watch the video, there's another man who was a little more humble, African-American man, well, I think he had a red shirt on, was a little more humble. So we dialogued, we talked, but then he got vulgar. Uh, then they didn't keep the word. They actually ended up breaking my stuff. And then it became, okay, you guys are just being proud. I'm going to oppose you like my father does. Mm -hmm. And to the people who get upset of how fired up I got or anyone got fired up, it's funny how they don't ask the riders or bring it up to them how fired up the riders got. Because not one time that I swear at any of them or anyone with us swore, yet they kept on swearing. Not one time that we threatened violence, yet they threatened violence. Mm -hmm. So the hypocrisy is just amazing to me. Um, but that's how we would do it. It's just that to all people, we come like them to help win them. So if it you. was you, you get what I'm saying? So, so to the Muslim, then we address Muslim issues and help to bring them to Christ. So it's not like I didn't go out there like, man, I'm, I'm going to start a riot again. It was, I want to bring these people to Christ. They're humble. They're willing to talk. Let's talk. And then it kind of just shifted. So we're able to talk to different people in different ways. It's, there's not like one way where I'm set, like, okay, this is exactly what I'm going to do. All right. I, I got you. As a follow up, can, can I? Can we talk a little bit about our Facebook yes, conversation last week? Is fair game? Mm -hmm. Okay. So sure. you know we we were setting this up, um, and uh, you were like, uh, we were just talking like, hey, where are you from, et cetera, et cetera. You're like, hey, have you heard of the gospel? And that's the second time you asked me. The first time I was like, hey, let's meet in person. I thought you were still local, and you were like, no, right now. And you know, I, cause that was like right after the Nini's issue, right? I know. And I know you talked about like on the interview this week that you had the bounce. You guys had to like bail up, you know, because because of the the heat. And I, we can get to that. Um, so you asked me about the gospel, and I was like, "What do you mean, like the gospel of Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John?" I was like, well, no, the gospel of like you know Jesus Christ came die for your sins, and um, you know, would you like to um, leave Islam and follow Jesus, Mahin? And I I was like I was like, hey man, props to you for being direct. But I also felt like the approach was um, if I was taking a girl on a date, and, and I, I know we don't do sex out of, outside of marriage here, right? Um, it's, like take, it's like the way I was thinking about brain, like, man, this guy's like taking me on a date and trying to get laid before the date even starts. <laughs> you, be, and, and I'll tell you why, because um, generally, like, you know, the thing about Islam and Christianity, both, we are both proselytizing religions, right? So we have like, we preach the message. The other, other faith traditions don't necessarily like go out and do that kind of stuff, right? Um, so je I, I would have expected you to ask more questions first and then look or, because what, what I, I'll, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you what I do exactly. If I'm talking to like somebody and they're, um, they're saying something or they're asking me questions, I look for a gap. Like, you know, because if somebody's a committed Christian, for example, I'm not going to like go in there and say like, hey, this is why you're wrong. I'll like, hey, what's your understanding, et cetera. And I'll look for something. 
So sometimes, like, a, I, I've had a Christian tell me one time, well, I don't really believe everything in the Bible is, is it's in the Bible. So then alarm goes off for me. I'm like, oh, well, what do you, like, why? Like, that, how can you be a Christian but not believe in the Bible? The, if the Bible is the word of God, then how can you just, like, pick and choose? Like, and, it like, and it was like, oh, well, I don't like what they say about gay people. I'm like, but why does that, or homosexuals, like, okay, listen, like, but wh why is that a theological issue? You know what I'm saying? Like, why is that a problem with you believing this is from God? You know what I'm saying? And so that's when I'll start the dialogue. You, you, but you, the, the, the drift is, it, I was like, normally, um, if we have like a, a table where we're preaching the Islamic faith somewhere, we, it'll be pamphlets and stuff. People might walk by, we might ask them some questions, they dialogue will dialogue. But usually, I, I'm not going to go for the sale, like the pitch, you know, the clothes, right off the bat. So I was like, uh, curious, like, how come you didn't warm me up a little bit? <laughs> That's a great question, man. Well, you almost answered it yourself. I'm not a salesman. <laughs> Paul said in the Bible, uh, knowing the terror of God, we urge men to repent. So I know the terror of God that awaits people who don't turn to Jesus Christ. So that's why it's such a pressing issue for me. It's more important than me having small talk with you. And my brother could even tell you that he's made a mistake of doing that many times, talking to people, just small talk and being friends, which is not wrong. And then kind of bringing the message, the gospel, the good news about Jesus later. And if you read the Bible, the gospel of Jesus Christ is the center of the conversations. When Paul is witnessing, and that means preaching, tell them about Jesus. His main message is the gospel. It's not small talk. So almost like you said, I'm not a salesman. I'm not trying to trick you into some warm anybody up. I'm preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I don't want to see people go to hell. I see. Now, but again, people are operating yeah. from a framework, right? So when you're talking like, okay, as, as a, like when you're preaching, you're quoting from the Bible, right? You're talking to somebody who may very likely probably doesn't give the Bible like, they, they may be like most people in America, most people in the United States have some kind of Christian background, right? Would you, I don't know if you'd agree with that or not, but at least someone in their family they you know, but who knows how long they, they, they've not been practicing or whatever. Um, so when you're quoting from the Bible, how, how do you expect them to um, grasp the Bible? If we haven't established, first of all, for them that why the Bible should be an authority for them. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so if I'm getting you right, you're saying, why bring up the Bible if they don't really believe it? Is that what you're saying? Correct. Yeah. Because like, so m a lot of people will say, listen, I believe in God. I believe in a higher power. And if you can, pr if you can prove to me that the Bible is from God, then that's, then we can have a conversation. Right. Um, so I, th that's what I was asking. Like when you're, when you're quoting the Bible to a lot of these folks, I think that's where the frame, you, you've got to kind of get them into like understanding the first part first. And then you can say, okay, well, if you believe that the Bible is the word of God, this is what the Bible says. You feel, you feel what I'm saying? Is it, is no, I understand what you're saying. And there are times where we do do that. Okay. Well, when people are more humble and asking about the Bible like that, okay. which you didn't have much of that. Mm. Um, but when you read the Bible, they are proclaiming the Bible. They don't always have to say, this is the word of God. Um, and the Bible says that faith comes from hearing the word. So when I preach the word to somebody, they are receiving an impartation of some faith in Christ. They may not accept it. They may not receive it but they're at least hearing the word about Christ. So it's the word of God that has power. So that's why I preach it to them, even if they don't believe it. Before I was a Christian, I hated the word of God. That people kept preaching it to me and it got planted in my heart, like the Bible says, like a seed. Then other people watered it and God grew it. So my hope is that I planted that seed and that other people water it and God will grow it. So whether or not they receive it. Cool, cool. Joe, you wanted to say something? Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I, I just wanted to share because this had come up with your discussion with the uh, the blogger. What was his name? Just so I can. Uh, Christian, it. Christian. Okay. Oh, wow. Good. Okay. In your discussion. <laughs> of all names, with, right? Yeah. Yeah. With, with, with Christian, basically the, the idea was, okay, if these guys have these beliefs, that's one thing, but their PR sucks. Like what in the world? Uh, they could not have done it worse. The, the problem is, is that Christian is probably thinking as a millennial how we could PR this better 
And even maybe as yourself, we have different approaches. And even among Christians, there may be different approaches. But see, the thing is, we look at the scriptures to teach us how to have an approach. And by his judgments, we'll be, you know, on judgment day, his judgments are the ones that matter. So I just want to give, if I can, quickly, can I give two scriptures quickly so you can hear it from the sure. writings? Of scripture? Okay. Mm -hmm. So in second, uh, first Thessalonians chapter two, verse one, it says, brothers and sisters, you know that our visit to you was not without results. We had previously suffered, had been treated outrageously in Philippi, as you know, but with the help of God, we dare to tell you his gospel in the face of strong opposition. So Paul's already starting very similar where we were at. He says, guys, I preached in the face of strong opposition. Now notice what he does here, verse three. It says, for the appeal we make does not spring from error or impure motives, nor are we trying to trick you. See, that is very key to understanding what we're doing. We're not trying to trick them. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God and trusted with the gospel. We're not trying to please people, but God who will test our hearts. Now listen to verse five. It says, you know, we never used flattery. And then he goes on to keep going. And then the other verse is he said, Paul speaking, this is an apostle to us. This is a prophet, a leader to us. He says, we destroy 2 Corinthians 10, 5, every argument and lofty, lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. So just so you can understand our perspective, when we're coming to a person, we want to be cordial, nice, treat them as we want to be treated, but we do not want to have an impure motive or flatter. And that's where I think you had said, Mahin, before, well, we at least have to give them credit for saying what they believe. And a lot of Christians are not saying what they believe. Now, uh, if we go back and listen to his uh, approach, I listened to it a few more times, even with the Black Lives Matter killing more than the KKK, which was supposed to insert the term through believing in abortion. Even there, he's not screaming. His face is not red. He's basically just confronting a Black Lives Matter person going, you care so much about the black people. Do you not know that Black Lives Matter supports abortion? And therefore, they're responsible for more deaths than even the racist KKK. That was his point. He's not screaming. And when we came there and the speaker was so loud and there was people fighting over the speaker and all that, you can see that I said, turn it off. And I just began to walk around going, can we have rational discussion? So from, from literally the point I was there onward, no one wanted to have a back and forth. No one wanted to do this. That had devolved since Wednesday. And so for people like yourself, this is where I wish the difference would be known. There would have been a different approach if most people would have been like yourself, just like, mm -hmm. hey, explain it more to me. But your post was getting lost in all of the other death threats. Yeah. When we were out there that day, I was having, so was Jose, rational conversations with people. But then all of a sudden, like a group of 10 to 15 would surround one of us. Mm -hmm. So we would have to leave that rational conversation and stand guard as these people were screaming at us. So it's kind of uh, like a firefight. It's like a firefight, right? You, you can't exactly. like, yeah. Um, yeah. Cause I remember on your Thursday night live stream, I was commenting and I was trying to like say, Hey, like, um, let's hear these guys out. And plus it was like, you have the right to believe what you believe. I mean, that's, that's ultimately what it comes down to. Um, the, this is the issue that, um, we agree on here is this isn't the scary thing is it's religious persecution, right? Um, you know, but before I get into that, I, I wanted to, uh, I, th I think there's a, um, Jose, what you were saying about how you, and you've mentioned this on your preaching as well, that if I understand correctly, and I spoke to Juan about this a couple weeks ago, uh, we were chatting on Instagram, um, the Christian belief, at least you guys' belief, I, cause like some Christians will say, oh, well, that's not us. You guys believe that if someone does not accept Jesus as their Lord and savior and, um, will, and, and what you, what do you what you mean by that that also includes like the, the the doctrine of the trinity and all that right the resurrection um that person will go to hellfire more or less right correct can you yeah can yeah you ever, I can talk you, more you, that's a great question yeah man. so like um, so 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 um that's so if, if, if that's what you believe then um that would make sense that you would want to because that becomes very specific. Like that person, that person is not saved. That person is going to hell. Is, 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 am I understanding you correctly? Uh, yeah, I mean, you did a pretty good job understanding that. Yeah. Okay. 
Um, so the, I think one of the, so that I would think changes your tone or sense of urgency in a way, right? Like you, like you were saying, um, so, and I guess I'm, I'm speaking from like the Islamic paradigm. We, um, don't specifically, we, we can't make judgments on specific people like me are, as a Muslim. So what we do is like the way I was dialoguing is like, oh, I'm just trying to plant a seed. Maybe 20 years down the line, that seed will grow somewhere, right? And if not, if that person dies a non-Muslim, well, God will be the ultimate judge. He'll have to examine that person's personal situation and say like, figure and then and judge accordingly, right? So I, th I think that's maybe one of the root, I'm trying to understand like, maybe there's, the, there's a belief that drives the action, right? So your belief, if, if I, you know, is that it's like, there's, there's so that your belief requires more of a sense of urgency versus like the way I would approach it, right? Is, is, would you agree with that? Yes, definitely. We are very urgent to the okay. Bible. So today is the day of salvation. Sure. Okay, cool, cool. Yeah. Sounds good. Sounds good. Um, we kind of touched on a little bit. Is there anything else about the aspect of Ninis that you guys wanted to cover before? Because I, I wanted to talk about um, some of the other political, religious intersections that are going on right now, how other Christians are reacting and how you guys are kind of getting like, labeled unfortunately as an as a fringe group when to me it's always been clear that this is like more or less the standard proto-orthodox position that you guys are having right anything else on ninis nope good okay um so pastor joe um as this has unfolded like what's been the reaction like from fellow pastors across the country in Chicago um are you start are you starting to see like I'm surprised has this Nini's that story gotten gone viral nationally yet amongst the church and how's the reaction been first of all yeah it's it's definitely mixed just like it is locally so you have people who look at what the Riascos went through and I, I find myself just really as a supporting actor um for some of Nini's friends and Chicago native friends, they thought I was hijacking something. But in all reality, I was just a support. I, I want to kind of sum this up. I could have stayed out of it. It, it, it. You know, if he went to another church, the pastor would have just stayed out of it and just said, hey, Juan, we're just praying for you. Hope everything works out over there. So for better or for worse, uh, there's, there is a sense of duty that I took upon myself to present Christianity to his friends on his request. And I took a hit out of that because some Christians even in our church didn't like that. They thought even in our church, we lost people because they said, you caused too much of a confusion with Christianity and Nini's. We want a church that doesn't create that confusion. But for me, I'm a community leader as well. So if I see someone in my church that's suffering, I'm going to stick up for them. And I can understand, like, when people saw me preaching that Thursday night, they're like, whoa, this is a fire hydrant. This is not even close to something we can receive. But the reason why I came out like that is because I wanted them to understand that for us, this is not a, uh, just a Nini's issue. This is a world issue. As you and I both agree, there's going to be a day of judgment. Everything's going to be laid waste. God's going to judge us all. Everyone needs to stop and think. And what's crazy to me, and, and I've thought about this often, is the psychology of it. These protesters looked at me screaming and shouting and thought that as anger and hate. And yet they go in our cities, scream and shout and do all of that. And they call that passion. So it's almost like the, the age old thing that would go on in the Middle East. A terrorist is a freedom fighter to the people that he's fighting for and a terrorist to the other opposing enemy. And it's the, the enemy. And it's the same thing here uh, to the greater church body. There's a lot of people who think we did what they wish they could do. So they put us on their podcast and they promote us and they say, we want other Christians to get ready to do this. And then there's others who say, uh, don't do this. Uh, we're going to do better PR. If something gets slipped out into the media, we're going to cover it up and we're going to make sure it doesn't blow up on us like them. Uh, for us, as we put it as a whole, we think this is where we should be. Um, we think that uh, what, where I apologize and some of us apologize from is we can be careful or in our words, like I wish Jose's clip wouldn't have just said Black Lives Matter has killed more than the KKK. So what we've taken out of this is when we're preaching publicly and we're going to say something controversial, please get the facts straight. 
because they don't care. They don't give us a second chance. So we've come out of that going, I wish we could do that better. Also with the homosexuality, they kept saying we believe in gay conversion therapy because Juan was a former homosexual. That has nothing to do with us. We wish we would have clarified that like right off the bat. He was changed by God, you know, but overall, for what I am hearing, because I blocked a lot of other voices, we are hearing, good job, keep it up. And just like his last, his brother's last interview, people want to prepare the Christians for this. Mm. Jose, do you have anything to add to that? As far as the, re the reception that y'all have gotten? Yeah, no, I agree with everything my pastor uh, uh, said. I definitely do think uh, that's what we learned. That's what I've learned. Even now, I'm slowing down, making sure I get the words right. But it was still... It didn't matter. Like I was preaching recently and said similar things and talked it very nice and smiled the whole time and they were still upset. So it's Christianity they're upset about. Yeah. Do you guys have a minute to like explain? Because one of the things I like to do in my podcast is understand why people believe what they believe, right? Um, and um, Jose, I know we talked on Messenger. You told me a little bit about your story. I'd like to actually understand like your own perspectives of how you became Christians and how you and specifically even became a like, like Joe, you mentioned you've been running this church for 10 years or so. Um, Joe, since I, I don't know your background at all, you said you're Fort Wayne, how did you become a Christian? What was your upbringing like? Um, and like, what led you to this path? Thanks, man. Great question. We appreciate that about you, Mahid. And this is uh, just kind of like a discussion in the discussion. Notice how we're doing it now. Right. This is what we do prefer. Mm -hmm. And we do it on the streets. It's people who escalate it to different places right. that we have to meet them or run away, you know. And uh, sadly, sometimes the Bible says you have to leave, just like the Hijrah. Uh, I'm sure you believe in that. Uh, sure. Muhammad had to leave Mecca. You mm -hmm. know, there's, there's times where you have to shake off the dust. But this is what we prefer. We prefer uh, spending time together. My uh, story is pretty basic. My parents were raised Catholic. They became Christian in the belief system that, that now we've been talking about. And they raised me in it, but I turned away, went to drugs, high school dropout, got arrested a whole bunch of times for selling the drugs. And around 18 years old, with my life falling apart, my mother was praying for me, asking me to come back to Jesus, to, to take on his teachings. I got very upset with her, and I realized I had so much anger towards God that it was uh, irrational. So then I said, why am I so angry at God if I don't believe he exists, you know? So that, that kind of ate away at me. So I went back to her, and I said, you know, maybe this is worth a chance or, uh, you know, a shot. We call this a mustard seed of faith. I understand that now. I just said, I'm, you know, something's in my heart that gets me so provoked by this. Let me give it a shot. And, um, it, you know, in that prayer, my mom prayed for me. I felt the power of God. I repented of my sins. I really saw that that was the truth. And then a few months later, I start preaching, doing what we're doing now on the streets, helping the homeless. And by the way, no one ever talks about that. Uh, we do things out of my community here in Elgin. We're doing things uh, out in Chicago. We got a back to school bash, all of these things. Nobody ever talked about that. We've been doing this forever. So I've always had a heart for charity and preaching. And eventually it drew me to Bible College in New Orleans. I worked in Bourbon Street at night. During the day, I worked in the projects where the Hot Boys were from, where Master P, Third Ward, Fifth Ward, all of that, Seventh Ward. And then over time, I started a church after graduation. And then in time, came to Chicago, worked in another church, then started this church. And uh, we've, we've just always kind of embraced the Bible, the methods of the Bible. We understand it can be misunderstood. But for me, it, it touched my life. Like me getting upset with my mom uh, really drew me to that knowledge of why am I getting so upset. So not that we're trying to provoke people to anger, but as my brother was saying, that the terror of the Lord strikes something in our heart. Because if I was just saying, oh, you're going to go to this place in... Uh, you know, in, in, in the universe of Marvel, and you're going to suffer there, no one gets upset about that. If I say Santa Claus is going to judge, nobody gets upset about that. But in all of our religions, the moment we talk about a God who judges by certain commands that we mostly all have in common, the morals of the Bible, right? People get very upset very quickly. And that should be a understanding of our heart. That something is true about that because most of the times I get the most mad when I'm arguing with my wife or my parents because they're hitting me the closest to my heart. So that provoked me to Christianity. And it was God's love, his mercy, his grace that showed me I could be forgiven of all of those things and then, you know, live a different life. So that you was make, my story. So are you, are you the founder of Metro Praise then? Yes. Okay. What does it mean to like find it? Like how do you like um, – 
that's, that's, that's interesting. Like when you graduate from like seminary or, you know, yeah. how do you go about finding, like starting your own church? How does that work? Like, yeah, is, just, is it like a business kind of like the well, same way? Not, I mean, I don't want to say it's a business, but I'm saying like the logistics and, yeah. you know, finding a place and all that, like what goes into that? Very similar to the Muslim belief, just so, so those who understand that I've studied Islam as well. I have a book back here on, on Islam. I'm not an expert by any means, but very much the same way. If you wanted to start a, a prayer time, you know, in your community, and then you would get a sheikh, an imam, someone that had been trained, they would come. They're usually coming from another school, a masjid. They're coming from a place where they've been trained. Very similar. So I've been trained, and uh, my elders, that's what we call them in the church, uh, who train up pastors are not ashamed of me. They're actually very proud of me. So they would, they are supportive of me during this time. Um, but back then they, they gave me their approval to start a church. So we call that an ordination where basically those who have the traditions of the apostles recognize the other traditions, uh, recognize the person, uh, a new person to spread those traditions. Now denominations, they have a formalized process. And then the Roman Catholic and Orthodox, which claim to be the most ancient, which we disagree, they claim their processes are the only ones that are legitimate. So all the other denominations do not have legitimate processes unless they come through the Orthodox or Catholic way. But for most Christians, like you would meet Mahin, came through the way I did. They go to a Bible college, they meet a group of elders, pastors they trust, they're sent out, and then they're overseen by the doctrines. So just for example, if at any time I start teaching doctrines other than what we started the church with, they can bring um, accusations against me and have me removed from being their pastor. So there, there's no cult thing here. They're, they're not following my whims of beliefs. And if I change my beliefs, Jose can bring formal accusations. That's actually written in our bylaws, because that is a part of what you do in America. You write bylaws. But if we weren't in America, that would still be what we'd call our policy, our church policy. They can say, Joe is now sleeping with multiple women. He has multiple wives, or he's teaching something other than the Trinity. And this, this document says his church must be this way, you know? Mm. Okay. Makes sense. Makes sense. All right, Jose, the floor is yours. I want to hear, hear a little bit, share the listeners. Uh, Cause people like, and I, and I really want you to, I really want people to hear this because when pe people just see the Jose Riesco outside of Nini's Deli, like preaching, right. They're like, how did this guy get here? Right. Like, you know, talk, talk a little bit about your story. Yeah. Thanks man. Um, I was not raised Christian. Um, I was raised, Rome. my mother was Roman Catholic, so I did, uh, like what Joe talks about, the kind of things that they had us do, which aren't in the Bible, many of them, and at least not the way they do it. And my father was a Muslim. For 90 plus percent of his life, he became a Christian in August 2019, then passed away a couple months after that, so I praise God for that. Uh, not that he passed away, but that he became a Christian before he died. Uh, so I was not raised Christian. I actually had, like Joe had, a very strong hate towards God. I remember sticking up my middle finger towards God, uh, saying things like, I hope Jesus comes back. I'll kill him again. Um, I've been arrested seven times. I was a violent uh, gang member in Chicago. Um, yeah, I, I loved doing drugs, sleeping around. You know, that, that, that was my life. I loved it. It was what I wanted to do. And I um, had no, no whims about being a Christian. When I became a Christian, my friends were like, you were the last person. I can, I can honestly tell you, I'm thinking about my friend right now who said, you were the last person who I would think would be a Christian. Um, but then the Bible says that God gives grace to the humble. I humbled myself after hearing the Bible so many times. Uh, uh, pastor Joe was pastor, one of my good friends from high school, Roberto Govea, who would constantly preach to me. He's a pastor at our church now, constantly sharing the scriptures with me, just like how, similar to the way I was preaching, just sharing the word, you know, didn't pull no punches, you know, just sharing the word, sharing the Bible. And man, I had an encounter with God. I just... Uh, uh, was doing something wrong and I felt terrible and I felt the Holy Spirit convicting me like showing me that I was wrong and I literally turned from my ways and I said I'm going to follow Jesus and I went downstairs at the time I was actually this is above Minnie's Deli and I ran, walked down the stairs and I opened that that side door when I opened the door the sun the S-U-N sun blinded me and I couldn't see and then God opened my eyes and then the Bible talks about how God opens Jesus opens the eyes that are blind and the Bible says and John 3, 3, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. So Jesus gave me new life that moment when I turned away from my own ways and followed him. That I had no real Christian upbringing, but God was just gracious to me, even though I was an enemy of God. Uh, the Bible said that he loves his enemies. 
Well, well, thank you for sharing that. And Jose, I want to like now segue into like, how are you guys doing right now? I mean, obviously, you know, you're, you know, I shared a little bit about, I don't know how much I, I understand that there's detail you don't want to get into because of the death threats and all that. But how is, how is, how are you and your family doing right now? In like, in after, like we're about what, two months out? Yeah, sure. Thanks. Good question, man. Um, my wife actually asked me that yesterday when we were eating dinner. And I honestly told her, for the most part, I feel great. Um, you know, I'm serving Jesus. The Bible says to live is Christ is to, and to die is gain. So to live on this earth, I'm like Jesus. It's a blessing. Even when I get persecuted, we love our enemies. We pray for them. And to die is gain. So even if I die, I actually gain more because I go to be with Jesus. So I can honestly tell you, man, although there are physical things that we lost, like you were talking about, and you, my brother has even shared like emotions. You do feel the emotions. They're like the Bible says, we don't go off the emotions. We walk by faith, not by sight. So even when we feel like these things that in our physical body, emotions that you're sad about this and, you know, you miss this. And I, I really miss my church family just being with them. Um, but I walk by faith and not by sight. And I can honestly tell you, man, I, I'm doing, we're doing great by God's grace. Okay. Um, this question for both of you guys, as you guys, I mean, you guys have mentioned that people are getting doxxed, right? This idea of like people, like I remember people, you know, that people are finding out if they go to Metro Praise, let me call it their, their human resources at their employer and get them doxxed, get them trying to get them fired with that going on. Um, have you received any support from non-Christians at all? on that issue because i think that's like something that even christian on our podcast with him like everyone is in agreement that like all right th that's going too far like you can disagree with things but when people are i mean people i know jose people were calling for your wife's job and i saw posts that like juan's wife was on a scholarship and they were like oh her scholarship should be give you revoked right um that to me was like really disturbing um but I just wanted to get your take. Like, what what's been the aftermath of that? Have you, like, are there ways to protect yourself? Have you have non Christians come out and support you guys in that? Like, what what recourse do you have? So, can I address that, brother? So, yeah, I'll address that. Um, so, my wife actually did lose her job. I lost my job. I was a government employee. Um, due to that, I did not work in Edie's Dead what people thought. I mean, I worked here and there just help out. Um, so yeah, just to clarify that. And I worked at the job, I lost it. And the support I had was little, if any, uh, from people who are not Christians. Um, I would say the greatest support I received was just my cousin yesterday, actually, who's not a Christian, just supported the video that we put out and saying that that's my family and I support it. But I have not really had much support. Uh, even my own job, many of them claim to be Christians you know, uh, quickly labeled me a bigot, made a public post. So um, I, for me personally, I have seen little, if any, support uh, from people who are not Christians. You know, how does that, so, you know, I, I was telling Joe before you jumped on the live stream, so I host another podcast as well that I, for about four years, and I probably said some ridiculous stuff on there, to be honest. And sometimes I'm like wondering, like, if they ever got a hold of some clips, man, and sent sure. to my human resources, like, <laughs> but I was like, you know, cause you always wonder, like, you think there's a separation, like my well, podcast is something like I'm doing this on a Saturday morning. It's something I do in my spare time. And if I'm not bringing that to the workplace, like, why does that matter? How did that come up with you? Like when you, when you found out uh, from your superiors, how could they, I guess, nail you on that? That's what, that's, that's my question. That, that's, that's the shocking thing about it. Yeah, well, from the live feed, I think it was my live feed, they were, yeah, I'm actually pretty sure it was that. They were already saying, you know, giving out my employee information. I gave it, I don't mind. It's funny because I never had my employee information on there because I know I had Christ, real Christian beliefs that people don't like. So I didn't do it, but I think about a month before that happened, the Lord told me to put it on there. And I said, Lord, if I put it on there, they're going to know where I work at. Um, but God knows all things, so he had me put it on there, and thank God's, I know God's using it for his glory. Um, so, yeah, I had it on there. They found out. They were emailing me. I don't know. I'm not emailing me. I'm sorry. Emailing my job. I found out that Monday. That happened Friday. 
and that Monday they gave me a call. You know, I expected something. And they basically put me on administrative leave and they wouldn't even want to tell me the, the specific charges, you know, but they had a Facebook post calling me a bigot and things like that. And, you know, insinuating that I was a racist and homophobe, things along those natures. But I'm like, many of you claim to be Christians anyways. You believe pretty much the same thing I do. So it was disheartening, man. It was like, how in the world is this legal? But I wonder if the people who are protesting have do anything in the dark that other, that their jobs wouldn't appreciate. You see what I'm saying? You, you can put anything I do in the dark here and I have no problem with it. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, but, but, but what they do in the dark, I, uh, the hypocrisy is just insane to me. Okay. No, that that's definitely sad. That that, that that's a sad thing to me. I, I think that most folks would agree. I mean, um, I I don't know how re what kind of reception this episode is gonna get from people. To be honest, like in my like, I'm sh sure people would be like, "My, you're pandering." I'm like, no, listen, this is like, because I think that um, one of the things that maybe we can segue into this a little bit is that the nature of my first live stream with my two friends when we were discussing the whole like Islam is evil thing, right? Okay, so. And that, just to recap it, like, I, I was like, if you're a Christian and you believe that this is what you have to believe to, to get salvation and the Islamic faith does, is against that, I mean, the Islamic faith will take you to the hellfire, right? Um, it's pretty logical. Um, again, like, now, would the term Eve people, I, I was like, okay, you could have the term evil might be a trigger word for somebody. So it might, like, I don't know, but it kind of captures the essence of it, right? In, in my understanding, like, that's how I look at it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, so to me, that, that's what I was kind of like trying to, you know, want to get to next is like these other worldviews that you guys are saying that are like, are problematic, or evil, whatever. Um, you know, that is one of the rights, but I think it's like, I personally wouldn't use the term evil, but again, you know, it's a concise word. So I, at the same time, I can't really like disagree with the, like at least the, the overall concept, right? Yeah. And when Jose made that post, his dad was still a Muslim. So what we're meaning by evil is not that the person is doing, um, these kinds of societal evil things and needs to be in jail. So they're rapists, they're child molesters, et cetera. What we mean by evil is reducing everything they do to heaven or hell. That's what we meant. And so if at the end of the day, you're in hell, then it didn't matter what you believed because it was evil. And, and this is not our words, this is Jesus. Jesus said there's only two paths. And this is where we split with Islam. Islam leaves hope for the Al-Kitab, people of the book, from people who have not heard uh, or had other prophets at different times, have not heard about Muhammad, et cetera. So, but we as Christians, we only have two paths. It's very simple. Either you accept Christ, and that's a narrow path. Few find it, the Bible says, or it's a, a wide path. But like you said in uh, you know, Quran 98, 6, it says, indeed, those who disbelieve among the people of the scripture, which we have. So now we have heard about Muhammad and we disbelieve. And the polytheists will be in the fire of hell, abiding eternally therein. They are the worst of creatures. So for uh, one point some, some billion Muslims, I am now the worst of creatures because I cannot say I don't know. I know Muhammad, I know of him, I know his stories, I have heard his deen, I have listened to it taught by the scholars, and I purposely disbelieve now. So now I'm the worst of creatures. There's no doubt about it. There's no hope for me uh, unless I were to repent. Inshallah, only God knows, right? But if in my disbelief I die, it's very clear I'm the worst of creature. I go to hellfire. So we're not intimidated by that. We actually think that's a very good conversation to have, why we disbelieve in Muhammad and why we think you should believe Jesus is the son of God. So I, I, the one thing I would clarify is that you yourself, Joe, if you drop that this minute, I couldn't say you're going to hell or you're the worst of creatures. The Quran does, though. No, but the, the understanding is it, it, these are general themes, right? Because at the end of the day, God, like w w the way we look, the, the way the um, Islamic faith teaches is that like we don't step, this is like God's realm. Because we, at the end of the day, right, he's going to look at your upbringing and, 
you know, see like, was he given the proper message? Are there other factors at play here? Societal, who knows, right? At the end of the day, it's, it's not my job. It's not my um, job to worry about how God's going to judge. Our job as Muslims, we just say, we convey the message, right? You know what I'm saying? I mean, I, I'm sure you, you're reading it that, that way. And I, I, I can see when you read it, it'll come off that way. But generally we wouldn't, um, you know, I, 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 I couldn't make that, I couldn't make that claim for you. Yeah, so you are a Muslim not yeah. making that claim, but there are different branches. The Salafi, I don't know, because you said you used to be a part of a more extreme version. I, 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 ca I came, I came uh, through the Salafi Dawah. Um, That's what I thought. So, you know, not to interrupt, but when you told me your story, I was wondering. I was, I was saying, I wonder if you was a Salafi, because now you, you, you admit you're not as extreme as you once were, right? Right. But yeah. Salafi, it's more like the term extreme. Like, so this is a you know maybe a good segue here. It's um, the goal, I think, of every person should be to um, find the faith that um, they believe is going to lead them to eternal salvation. Would you agree? Right? Like that's, and, yeah, and just to clarify, what I meant by extreme, I don't mean like extreme in the Fox News way. I mean, like, I'm considered extreme among other Christians. Oh. I would be like a Salafi among Christians. That's right. I mean. Yeah, yeah, you're, you're in a way. And I think th that's kind of a pejorative, to be honest. Um, it's, it's a different understanding of, like, how you approach the texts. That's what it comes down to. Like, a lot of things are, right? Like, what are you, like, um, so, um, but even then, I, I don't, I, so in, in those days, I remember clearly when I, I was at Ohio State, I was the, uh, the president of the Muslim Student Association there back in 2005, about 15 years ago now. And we had this old re like ratchet rundown Ohio Union. And I remember um, one time um, there was a, a gentleman I, from Campus Crusade for Christ came by named Matthew. Came by, we talked at a table outside, we're just chatting, and we were talking about this very issue. And then he was like, I reject Islam, and what if I go outside right now and get hit by a car and die? Where am I going? Like, we don't know. Right? We don't know because at the end of the day, that's like, to us, that's like the, the human being. The only, the only people we know about their eternal damnation are, if, if the Quran talks about it, like, the, like Pharaoh, right? Or the prophet Muhammad would, would speak about it. Like he was given knowledge of that, not because he himself knew, but because God gave him that knowledge about specific individuals. But generally we don't, um, we can't condemn our, that's why our message is to convey the message and whether or not they accept Islam is, that's uh, essentially, we always say in God's, uh, you know, in God's hands, right? Uh, we don't, uh, you know, the prophet himself, his own uncle didn't accept, right? And he was like, that's, it's not for you to, you know, decide who, uh, who, who accepts or who doesn't, right? So, so I think that's where, I don't even know if the Salafis would do it. Um, I, I found that to be the normative understanding. Um, you might meet Muslims who think that, but um, there's, um, when you dig a little deeper, you're like, what do they, what do you mean by that? And then you kind of, you kind of end up at the same space. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think we're close to the same thing. When a preacher preaches. Yeah. And he says what the Quran says. The you has to apply to someone. So, you know, you are the worst of all creatures. Well, who is the worst of all creatures? Those among the people of the book who disbelieved mm -hmm. and the polytheist who disbelieved. Now, if you're never going to address a you, like, then I don't see how you can really be faithful to preach the deen as Muhammad and the companions did, because they would say things to the people. We can go to the hadiths, but we don't have to get distracted into that. But right. uh, the preacher at some point has to say to the disbelief, I'm speaking to disbelievers. Otherwise, you're almost like uh, agnostic about everybody. I don't know who I'm speaking to. I don't know who mm -hmm. you are, what you've done. Uh, this would do away with all Sharia law, obviously. Mm -hmm. Do you still hold to Sharia? That, uh, 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 yeah, I, 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 try, I, try to do, I do my best. Um, but like, but, 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 I, but you're talking about two. So the laws of the disbelievers yeah. and the Sharia in this world are one thing yeah. and salvation is another thing. Yeah. But the, this is, I was just trying to use that as an example, right? Like when, when the Sharia is being practiced, somebody right. makes a judgment mm -hmm. and says, you have done X, Y, and Z. These are the punishments, you know, right. Right. I know what you're saying. You're almost leaving like a respect and honor for God that you don't think we have because we make a decision he doesn't. The only difference is in our scriptures, 
the you that we're speaking to is direct to them. And so when we speak the words, we're not supposed to give them a place to say, well, maybe there's another way out of this. We're supposed to let them know these are the words spoken to them by their behavior. So we could go into those scriptures, but it's a difference. I, I'm not saying that everyone has to agree how I see it. Yeah. I just believe that uh, there's different branches of Islam. They take it different ways. And, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'm, I take the scriptures the way the scriptures. Yeah. You know, and, and I think as um, obviously it would be um, above my pay grade or stepping on toes to start to interpret like if the Christian scriptures teach you that, then by all means, that's what you believe, right? Yeah, just to uh, give you an example for your listeners, if yeah. they go to Galatians chapter 5, verses 19 and onward, mm -hmm. it says, those who practice these things and it lists the deeds of the flesh shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Mm -hmm. So those are the scriptures that we would say. We'd say, if you're practicing this, my scripture tells me to tell you, you shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And we see this, like if you look at Andre Chaudhry, in London and others, mm -hmm. they will apply you know, the Salafi movement going into Wahhabism. They will apply these scriptures as well to those they see disbelieving or those they see, you know, doing the, you know, the, the things that, that are considered sin. So, I mean, you may not be down with those guys. I understand that, but it, it is a, a valid interpretation. You'd have to condemn quite a bit. No, of well, so the, the yeah. Anjum Chaudhry, man, I heard that name in years. Yeah, man, it's a blast from the past. He's in jail. <laughs> That's why, yeah. why? <laughs> That's why he's quiet. Yeah. Now that 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 dude one time, man, I remember. I'll tell you, I'll tell you a funny story. I was yeah. watching Fox. I think Sean Hannity was interviewing him on Fox News one time, right? Yeah. And so he was like, the, the queen, the queen of England is a legitimate target. Yes. I was like, bro, you live in the UK. Yes. <laughs> like, <laughs> yes. I was like, <laughs> but um, no. So like, so the ideology of Anjum Choudhury and. We we would we we would disagree like so I, I consider myself a Sunni within Sunniism, yeah. Salafia is a it could could be under the wing of Sunniism, but the the methodology of Anjim Chaudhry or like ISIS or Al Qaeda these are groups those groups would agree that you could specifically say someone's going to hell, but it, it, it's what they call the Kharijite movement right which if you look at Islamic history they arose during the time of the Caliph Ali right. Um, where if you commit a sin, you become a disbeliever, and then they, and they would and they would push that all the way. So um, Anjem, I, I I don't. It's people would detract and be like, well, he's not a Karajite, but he might have Karajite tendencies, right? So I, I I don't believe that there's a normative opinion within the Sunni tradition that would allow for, in this case specifically, like like I I, I like. To, to say Joe Wyrostek, if he dies right now, is going to hell, <laughs> right? I don't think that I could, I, I could find that opinion. But moving on, I, I kind of want to talk about um, get y'all's take on the other thing is that people seem to trigger a lot of folks is the issue of Roman Catholicism, which I myself I'm always kind of wondering about. Um, when you say that, because people would say like I've heard this before from other Christians, um, Baptists and whatnot. Hey, Catholics aren't really Christians. Um, when we talk, when you guys talk about Roman Catholics, um, help break that down for me, like a little bit. Um, like, what, what, why does that? Why are their views problematic for y'all? Sure, I'd like to break that down. Um, I was actually looking at official Roman Catholic doctrine, Roman Catholic teaching. I think it was about two days ago, um, and they officially teach things that the Bible says are, are evil. And just to backtrack a little, the reason we say evil is because that's also the language of the Bible. And John 7, 7, which I quote on the video many times, says, the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testified that it's works were evil. So Jesus testified to people, hey, the works are evil. Same thing I'm doing about uh, Islam and Roman Catholicism. It doesn't mean we don't, we don't love them, we don't care about them. And like I passed, it doesn't mean we think they're murderers. Even though in the eyes of God, they are murders by having hate but i mean like you know we don't think that it should be in jail so that's why we use the language evil because it's from the bible um so anyways talking about roman catholicism um they do many things that the bible says not to do and one of the things i was looking at from official vatican roman doctrine uh, was that they think it's okay to pray to mary and um things along that nature they honor her in a way that is above what we should honor regular normal human beings um, and, and, and praying to Mary is idolatry. So idolatry is when you worship or pray to someone who's not God. 
So we would say you pray to God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity. That's it. We don't pray to human beings. Uh, the only human being we pray to is Jesus Christ because he's God's Son who became a man. Um, so teachings like that, which are outright evil, is why we would say that they're not saved. They're not Christians. Another evil belief that they have, that many of them have, would be this belief that you are saved by faith in Jesus Christ. And with that, you must do these certain things to also be right with God. And you probably know about these things, you know, infant baptism, um, confession, confirmation, these things um, that they teach that you have to do to be right with God. The Bible says pretty clearly, it's faith in Jesus Christ alone that saves, not by the works, not by someone doing something good or bad, not by works so that no one can boast that we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So should we do good works? Yes, Christians want to do good works. But it's first faith in Jesus Christ that saves you, forgives you of your sin. And then after that, we do good works. The good works cannot be part of it. Or else then you nullify what Christ did on the cross and you then try to take some kind of ownership and saving yourself almost like you've uh, uh, become the savior to some degree. So that there's a lot of things, but that's, one uh, a couple of things that we would say that they do wrong and not everyone who calls himself a roman catholic we believe are wrong but people who are real roman catholics and agree to these official doctrine which would make you a real roman catholic you would be wrong but there are people i believe who could be sitting in a roman catholic church and not believe these things and be real christians but they need to be um led by the holy spirit led by god out of there to be in a real church right uh, i i feel like i'm gonna beat a dead horse here by asking this Go question ahead. as a follow-up um I like my understanding, like I used to go to Nini's probably, and I live in the South Suburbs. Like Nini's was a hike for me. It takes me like an hour to get there sometimes, but um, I'd probably be there like once or twice a month. Um, I would have to assume that a lot of Nini's clientele were like Roman Catholic, at least from a family point of view, right? Um, so that's where I think when they, when they saw that, it, I, I think what goes back to is that maybe they themselves don't understand their own tradition, okay? But the fact of the matter is that whole evil thing is like, is that something you guys would do differently or is there a way to have communicated with that, that aspect of the clientele better to like, cause at the end of the day, your goal here was to talk about, you know, the gospel. Right. And if you want to talk to these Roman Catholics, I assume like most Roman Catholics I've met are very like loose on their beliefs. They're not going to like be really hard. Like, you know what I'm saying? Um, so in a way, I would say they would be like low-hanging fruit for y'all, in a, in a sense. Um, would, would, looking back, would you have got, you know, got maybe a better approach to reach the Roman Catholic clientele rather than like, you know, lumping them in with all the other things? Because that I think that a lot of people saw that and they were like, without the understanding that you just explained to me, would be like, oh man, that, that's, I, I don't get that. That's why they, again, feeds in this whole narrative. This is an extreme fringe Christian group. Sure, I get what you're saying. Like, who we have said it differently. Yeah. I mean, if you go back to that post, which originally was an issue like over a year and a half ago when I said that, I don't think I could have done it much differently. Uh, maybe to the person who asked about it, but that's making a simple Facebook post. You know what I mean? I'm not going to have three paragraphs on it. But maybe talking to people, um, I mean, you could s cut it different ways, but I'm going to say the same thing. I'm going to say your works are evil. These things are evil. Don't do these no more. Follow Jesus. So maybe like I could have worded it here and there differently, but it's going to be the same thing. And even the, that's the language of the Bible. The Bible says there's nobody good. No, not even one. Mm -hmm. So the Bible calls us evil. The Bible calls all people evil until they put their faith in Jesus Christ. So that's the language of the Bible. And that's the language we're going to use. Although, like I'm saying, I, I can say that maybe we can cut it a little differently um, to that specific person if they wanted to talk about it. But for the most part, this is the preaching that saved me. This is the preaching uh, that Pastor Joe uh, instilled in, in the disciples. And, and that's not like he made it up. It's from the Bible. Mm -hmm. okay, that's what saved me. This is what led my father to give his life to Jesus. This is what led my Roman Catholic mother to give her life to Jesus. This is what led my former bisexual brother Juan to give his life to Jesus. So, yeah, this is how we're going to preach for the most part. Sure. Um, do you have a, do people ever give you the contention that like the, like, so um, there's a few, like if people look at it very cursory, like Roman cat, is it accurate that Roman Catholics, as far as people who call themselves Christians 
make up the majority by a slight majority in the world. Um, so number one, so I would ask two questions. Number one, is there, um, is, is, that, if, is that true? And if that's true, is there any problem for you guys on that? And secondly, the question is, is that Roman Catholics, um, they would say that Roman Catholics or, or Eastern and Eastern Orthodox predate Protestantism and, you know, the Pentecostal, the, the, you know, wing that you talked about, like Pastor Joe mentioned, you guys are about 100 years old or whatnot. Um, how do you reconcile that? Like when people look at origins of, of like, um, and, tr and try to trace back, because you're, you're trying to go back in time, that, that's like, that's people's natural inclination. You're trying to get back to how close are we are to the time of Jesus, right? Can I answer that, Jose? Appreciate that. Mahim, just to give up a bigger picture view here, uh, think about it like this. A lot of restaurants have closed permanently since COVID and because of the riots. God had a plan for Nini's, and now Nini's is closed. That's how we would see it. So to go back and say, could we have done this and maybe a different thing? Could we have done this? We believe that it was God's sovereignty and that God used it. There, like I said, there are restaurants that are permanently closed. My favorite one that's Mexican on Belmont, Gordo's, is closed. That must have been God's will. It's over. It's done, you know? Mm -hmm. So when we look back at this, I always like to be careful that we're not trying to change the will of God, though I know there's human responsibility. I'm not just saying everything is going to be God's will, so we do nothing, but could that have changed anything? Just, I don't know if you're asking that, but I just want to kind of bring that up as well, because I know that's come up in the other conversations. I don't think so. What, what I believe happened was BLM hijacked what would have been a normal conversation on a normal day. Like, this would have been normal. This would have continued with the majority of those customers. There was a certain few that took this and made it their own agenda. They, they conspired to make something that was totally irrelevant to the conversation. For example, Jose had wrote that thing a year prior. So what did Catholics feel like they were being treated like from the time Jose wrote it, Juan liked it, to the time it got shared during the BLM thing? How did they feel treated? Were you treated any different? Were you treated like you were evil in a societal sense? No, you were treated like a normal person. So. I think what brought us out into that moment to preach and to make it very clear was that people like you were not the voice. The voice was the death threats. The voice was, you're a racist. The voice was, we're going to dox you. And that's when we came out and said, we're going to say what we say. Now, just really simple. I know I took a lot of time there. Just in the history, the way we would summarize it is, is that the word of God is primary and that these people have changed it and we show it throughout history. In other words, there is a timeline of progression of change with Catholicism. Even into the 1960s, they believe that now Mary ascended to heaven instead of dying. That's called the Assumption of the Virgin Mary. That doctrine is nowhere taught in the early church. The other doctrines they've added on and added on came around the 500s until the modern times. And even now, they're trying to decide whether or not they're going to make Mary a co-redemptrix with Christ. And so what we simply do, like a Muslim, we can relate this to you. We go to the tradition of the first apostles, we go to the tradition of the scriptures, and we see these things have changed. So in one sense, yes, uh, we are a new movement. They're about one point some billion, we're about 700 million. We're a new movement, but we're a restorative movement. We're something restoring an ancient path. So it's not new in the sense of we created something, it's just something going back to the original. Gotcha, gotcha, makes, makes sense, makes sense. Um, Regarding the political, like some of the political stuff now, so some, one of the questions that I had received from some folks uh, leading up that they wanted me to ask is that they, they seem, that they're seeing a trend. Again, these are non-Christians. They're seeing a trend of um, people like yourselves. Like, would you characterize yourselves as evangelical? Can you ex actually explain what, because people use evangelical, sometimes it's a pejorative in a way. Can you, can you actually, like, since I brought that term up, let's, let's, I like to like make sure we, we're clear on definitions first before we start talking about stuff. You were breaking up. Can you repeat that, please? Yeah. Um, so I was saying that, like, um, first of all, the question is, would you characterize your church as evangelical? Like, can you define what evangelical means? My understanding is it just means you're evangelizing or exactly. preaching. That's where it comes from, evangelism. Okay. Um, okay. Evangeliso means you believe in the spreading of the gospel. Yes, uh, around the 60s and 70s, they, they made a move 
to unify all of the non-Catholic Christians under that title. Mm. So, okay. Um, so people have like, uh, like one of the questions that I've received, like in the last, you know, as we were leading up to this, to this show was that they feel like there's this kind of relationship between the evangelical Christians and certain elements of politics. For example, like with the perspective on coronavirus, right? Or, um, you know, exactly, or how, the, or, or, or police, or um, standing for the flag, et cetera, et cetera. Can you talk a little bit about that, about how your church informs like your politics? Sure, and then I can uh, toss it back to Jose. Uh, but basically, the Christian, even, well, the, yeah, the evangelical who's a Christian believes that God has a purpose for them in government. And so we believe when it says making disciples of nations in Matthew 28, that nations are to become converted to Christianity. And when uh, the founding of this nation happened, there were different branches of Christianity that saw that a certain way because it was one of the first times that it could be done without the oversight of the traditional church. So if you see Europe, Europe is like an experiment gone bad with the traditional churches. And so uh, the Protestants, going back to the original disciples, had a chance in America to do something that had never been done. And instantly the Puritans started creating a church state and that was rejected by the other Christians. That's where a lot of people don't understand is that the Christians that went against, the people who went against the church state were other Christians and they believed that there should be a separation not that we couldn't be Christians in the state, but that trying to marry it again wouldn't work because they had already started to see it in some Protestant nations like Germany, Switzerland, and others. As they were breaking away, they were actually burning people now at the stakes who were Protestants of the Protestants. So it's just, you know, it wasn't working. And so we, when we as Christians look at the founding of this nation, we see that there's a lot of good that those original Christians did by trying to separate church and state, but yet being Christians. So for an example, they had prayer meetings. We still have a chaplain before the Congress, but you don't have to be a certain denomination. We see that it's good to swear upon the Bible to make your oath, but you, you, know, you can choose another book if you want to, et cetera. We believe that the holidays, if we're gonna take days off, should be for Christian holidays, Easter and Christmas, but that doesn't mean you have to. Uh, and I'm not saying they've always done that right, but I'm just trying to give a nut, uh, in a nutshell. And so now uh, what they're seeing, what we are seeing, is that because Christianity and, and our beliefs have gone down in mainstream churches, people are following this, they're compromised, that now we're compromised in our voting. So we're voting in pro-abortion people, people who are pro uh, LGBTQ, not that they shouldn't have rights, but that, that, that these rights should supersede our rights. So meaning that if a Christian school doesn't support transgenderism, they should lose federal funding. We're voting, now Christians are voting in these kind of people, and there's now a conflict among them, just like there's a conflict in all the other issues. And so there's, uh, like if we're gonna talk specifically about Trump, people, a lot of people like myself don't see Trump as an evangelical, but we see him leaning more towards our positions. So people may say he's pandering to us, but at least he's pandering because Hillary Clinton at that time didn't do anything for us. She was fully against us. She would have taken away federal funding possibly from Christian universities because of LGBTQ. She would have furthered abortion. She would have defunded, and this is where we may disagree, of course, uh, towards support of Israel and other things that we agree towards. So when it simply comes towards politics, Christians have always believed in America, the ones that are trying to believe in a, a good division of church and state, that our values should be upheld, and now we see them being lessened. Mm, okay, makes sense, makes sense. As far as like, but do you, uh, you know, it's, like to me, it's a little, it, it you know, because I, I, it's almost like people want to try to make this connection between the evangelical church and like white supremacy. I don't know if you've got that accusation. Have you had? Have you had that accusation? Have you heard it at least thrown at you? And you broke up again, my friend, right at the pivotal point. Can you I was like, have you heard the accusation that um, the evangelical church is just like another like element of white supremacy? It's, yeah, I've heard that for people who don't understand what we're doing. Um, just, to, just to make the comparison again because of the Islamic yeah. belief. Right. If you look at Turkey, if you look at uh, various nations, you know, uh, Indonesia, 
uh, where Islam is trying to have somewhat of uh, influence, Pakistan, etc. There's always going to be these um, these kind of conspiracies from the religion to the government. Uh, Christians used to have that kind of place in America where they had a lot of influence. And because of that, things that went wrong in America were then attributed to them. So uh, because there was slavery in America and Christians were the majority, uh, Christians now are slave owners, et cetera. But what they don't understand is where did this, where did this, uh, the Civil War come from? Christians opposing those what we would call heretical Christians. If you believe you can own someone and beat them and buy and sell them, you are by our definition a heretical Christian. And we proved it by killing our own people. Literally, we drew lines in the sand and said, if you're across that border, we're gonna kill you now, you know? So uh, the same thing with the civil rights, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Uh, so this idea has always been Christians doing true Christianity have been good for the nation versus the other side. So uh, our Bible doesn't support white supremacy. It doesn't have anything to do with the color of white. We're all brown, by the way, there's different shades of brown. I'm a reddish brown. You're maybe more of like a uh, more tanner brown, et cetera. But, but there's one race, the human race, Christianity affirms them all. And whatever was in our past in America, Christians corrected it. That's the way we look at it. You know, um, I, when you guys, um, when Juan first decided to not make the stance on the BLM, like people were calling for it, I immediately recognized why. And I messaged him. I think uh, the number he had like three phone numbers ago, I think. I think he had to change his number twice, right? So I, I just texted him. And because we have that same issue. So, you know, I want to talk a little bit about that because even though I, I might get hated on for this, but the Black Lives Matter organization is what. You got, when you guys are talking about the agenda, that's what you're talking about, correct? Like exactly. I'm so glad you're going there because I have it all. I already have the scriptures in the Quran. You guys are not with that agenda either. Um, you know, so I think that's where. So, but we're having this. The Muslims in America are having this, like, um, these. You know, our, our situation, you know, it's it's different, but maybe have we have similar paths going on here, right? So we're obviously much smaller in number than y'all in america like we're what they said like one percent and then i don't even know of that one percent how many are actually like practicing i mean some people say like 10 20 percent like maybe 80 percent aren't doing anything um so this whole the, the black lives matter organization is something that has been endorsed um by originally was endorsed by like the mainstream islamic organizations right um, but then when started, people started asking questions, they were like, hey, listen, there's stuff on here that are you sure we're getting behind? And then we were like, we took a pause. And then what was going on is that we, but we were like, and what we try, we try to, what I try to do is like, okay, let's look at, let's talk to the black Muslim activists that we have so we can help them understand. And then we would, so people would say different things. Some people would be like, listen, the organization we don't agree with. Okay. But what's going on on the grassroots is a de it's a decentralized organization. So what happens in like Cincinnati, Ohio, for instance, um, it's completely divorced from the mission of the organization because we don't even know that this is going on. Some people would counter and be like, well, you're using the same name, so you're still kind of implicitly endorsing it. Um, you know, and then I have recently come across like, you know, I I've got friends who are, like, you know, black Muslims who are, bus you know, and they're like, no, this B the BLM organization is attack on the heterosexual black man, right? Um, and we can't get behind it. It's another way to like use intersectionality to like hijack some narrative and then kind of like sh show your, and, and, and that's what's, again, we're seeing um, the same play. And, and so this is the struggle we are having as our own faith community, like regulating this because like, if we talk about it, like I'll get docs, like right now, like I'll get attacked because my, you're talking about BLM and there's no black person on the panel. It's, it's you, a brown dude talking to like a half, like, you know, Cuban, half Mexican guy and a white guy. Right. Um, so I think that's, um, we're quarter Cuban, quarter Lebanese. Sorry. <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. So like, that's where the, um, Th th that 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 to me is like really where it's concerning like we're not allowed to have like an opinion and now you're seeing that manifest itself now with like the whole biden kamala harris you know situation right where people are like well we you know because they by 
all admission, nobody wanted it. We're like, oh, that, the, but it's the lesser of two evils and they're better. I'm like, well, on what grounds? Like, listen, let's talk about this on a policy perspective. Let's really examine it because um, we're not, because there's like this narrative being created that we're just exposed to like, you know, just buy into. Yeah, Southeast Asians around my neighborhood voted for Trump and we're proud of it, you know? So uh, there's a lot of discussion going on. And I was curious in your community. So yeah, when you talk to the black Muslims, they're very offended by the removal of the black husband, the black father, because Islam has a lot of teachings about that, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. And, and so I think that's where it's like being co-optive. Um, there is like room, again, for interpretation as far as like, how do we use ideal, like certain ideologies for example like there's this aspect of feminism right what is fem and so the question i would ask is like what does feminism mean to us um you know which wave are you talking about um i tend to not automatically dismiss it like i try to at least i'm like let me hear you out or someone's talking about what they call critical race theory right i'm like all obviously our foundational worldview is based upon the quran and the sunnah of the prophet muhammad but at the same time it's like I'm trying to understand like from a different, there's certain things that I just might not be a specialist in, right? Like I'm an engineer by degree. My professors at Ohio State were not Muslims. So they taught me about engineering and thermodynamics and all this stuff, right? So that's how I navigate it. I'm questioning, I want to ask you guys, how do you deal with like these other um, ideologies? Do you think you can use them as tools as long as it's very clear on what, where you draw the line? Or do you think you can get your entire worldview from the church and from the Bible, et cetera? Yeah, I, I just want to share this. I know Jose wants to come in, but I, I feel the left is using you. They're using you just like they're using black people. As you listen to the conservatives, they're, they'll show you how, you know, because I'm not here to represent conservatism, but I would say if you watch Prager University or other conservative branches that make their media known, just take a look at it and see if they're using you because they're using the black vote, they're using the brown vote, Southeast Asian, Muslim, Hindu, etc. They're trying to get you to overthrow evangelical beliefs. They're trying to paint us as bad, but we actually all share the same morals. We, they're, all of us believe in these certain things that they don't believe in, and they're wanting to smuggle that in. That's why I love in London when they uh, started adding this curriculum into the schools, the Muslims started rising up as well. Well, normally, who do you see doing that in America? Somebody in the South coming to the school going, hey, we don't want this taught here. But I'm telling you, my friend, it's, it's coming to all of us. They're just, they're, they're just not coming to you now because they need your ally. They need you as an ally. But once they've gotten further on down the road, because let's think about this, China, we're both persecuted, right? There's nations where, where Muslims persecute Christians. We can talk about that later. But in China, we're both persecuted. Because when they go further down the road, they want neither one of us to have our worldview. But I'll let Jose take it from there. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah, amen. I agree with Pastor Joe saying um, that we should get, as Christians, should get all our morals, our worldview from the Bible. Uh, the Bible testifies in Isaiah 48. It says, the grass withers and flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. See, me and you, Mike, are going to pass away, uh, you know, uh, our church could even, they try to take down the building. The building can go. We can, Pastor Joe could die. Uh, you know what I mean? Christianity can get stamped out of, stamped out of America. I don't want it to, but it could. But what's going to last forever? It's the word of God. See, the word of God and Christians that are founded on the word of God are going to last forever. We're going to live forever. And then another scripture that could help you with is, is 2 Timothy 3.16, very popular scripture in our faith. All scripture, all the Bible, Old Testament, New Testament is God brief and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. So all scripture can be used to teach people, to rebuke them, tell them when they're wrong, to correct them, show them what's the right way, and to teach. So we believe what the Bible says, that it's the word of God is going to endure forever and all our foundation, our whole foundation and all our worldview should be built on the word of God. Is that how? I'm sorry, yes, if all the Abrahamic faiths, Catholic, Christian, Muslim, Jew, all voted together, our culture would be a hundred times better right now, period. We would all, 
we would all have much safer streets. We would all have much better schools. We would all have much fairer policies because we all hold to the same general commands. We, we believe that, that adultery is a sin. We believe that perversion is sin. We believe that violence should be punished. We all believe in, in, you know, in the upholding of the good, tearing down of the bad. Yeah, I mean, what do you think? I'm curious to what you think. Yeah, I mean, like I, 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 like I said, I think there's always there, there's always an agree. There's all there's this narrative, like so there's always this um, voice in the Muslim community that are like, with with evangel Muslims and like evangelical Christians, because like I won't, I won't say it's evangelicals because regular Christians or just lay people are the ones that didn't like do jack when y'all were getting like cruci like persecuted, right? Um, but evangelicals, I think that we, we, we have an interesting relationship with them, I think, in America. And even in the Quran, you know, you, you, I seem like you've read the Quran. You see that the Quran tells us that the Christians are closest to us amongst all the faith traditions, right? Um, but there's also, I think there's this fear that, like, if we let evangelicals, like, if we support it, if we get behind it, and if America is, becomes a Christian country, but so to, so to speak, right, if that's something, because it, it's not, it's not, practical or realistic that um america is going to be a muslim country anytime soon i mean we're such a we're such a tiny percentage right um but like if if we so you know you hear this idea that muslims should push for america to become a christian country because under a christian country we could have the same values we don't have to worry about certain things being censored but then there's this idea that this fear of like oh are we going to be then subjugated to persecution as a religious minority then I think that's the fear that people have in their head. Like, is that going to happen? I, I, I think, I think it's a legitimate fear. It's like, we don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's, uh, you know, cause power can corrupt who knows, but you know, in the same, in the same frame, like you, 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 you alluded to that, like, um, you know, Christians may be facing persecution in Islamic countries. Um, you know, certainly the, an Islamic state, an actual, like, uh, a, a state which doesn't exist today, but that was governed by the Sharia, would afford uh, Christians and the Jews like their religious rights and their duties and etc. Um, but I think that, that that's the fear for Muslims. That maybe that's what you're seeing is like the evangelicals they hate us, and therefore they, um, if we get behind them, my my personal approach is that we haven't really engaged with the evangelical community the way we need to. Um, and there isn't, there's certainly like a misrepresentation in the last 20 years about Muslims engaging with the right wing, whether that's Republicans, Libertarians, um, whatever that means to you, right? I, I don't like think, I, I really don't like this identity politics where like we have to all side. Like, listen, if, if you agree with the platform of the Republicans based on their policies, based upon their policies, not upon like some like identity thing or, you know, what Donald Trump says on Twitter, right? Because at the end of the day, what he says on Twitter is it really is it is that's not a policy. That's like yeah, he he, he might because I've had my uh, I've had Muslim friends who tell me like we think Donald Trump is a scumbag, but he is a very effective president. So like these two things can be balanced in that way. Like you know what I'm saying? Um, and and we would agree. We would agree. And that's that's what we say. We we're not convinced that he is an evangelical Christian. We think uh, very scummy of a lot of the things he has done, but we're, we're trying to align with someone that has more uh, of our platform, you know? And I can just tell you, my friend, Joe Biden and these folks, they do not have the best interest for the Muslim in mind at all. They don't value what you value. They don't value the home of a Muslim. When you go to a Muslim's home and you get to know their family, you get to live in their community like I do here, Lot, uh, Southeast Asian, I'm assuming, is your ancestry as well? Yeah, I'm from Bangladesh. Bangladesh, wonderful. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, you know, it's it's not it's not what the uh, the left is promoting: the family, the home, the children, the upbringing, the conservatism. You know, mm -hmm. uh, you are cons which is so weird. Yeah, I can almost imagine the conflict it creates in you because you are conservative in your life, but now how do you can view that when it comes to politics? Conservative, right? But you are conservative because even in our joke here, and you were talking about him coming at you very strong. You're like, hey, we don't believe with sex before marriage, you know. Uh, but if you think about what they're doing in our schools, they want to hand out condoms to our children without us knowing. They even want them to be able to have sex changes without us knowing. So if a child, your child, man, let's think about this, Mahi. If your child 
goes to a public school and says to their teacher, because of what you've taught me here, I'm questioning if I'm a boy or a girl, all of those conversations can happen without you present. And if they get to the point of surgery and you try to interfere under the left's administration, they will make it illegal for you to do so. How do we know this? Already there are court cases happening in America right now. Now it's between a mother in the custody and the father, they're divorced, but they're still in favor of the mother making the decision. And before you know it, they'll be able to do it without the mother or the father. Mm. Um, what's your take? So like I um, was, I, I think I said this openly in the last podcast I did with um, one of the recent shows with Steve Cutler, who's from the Republican Party in Ohio. And I said like, you know, I, I think the, the case is strong for Trump personally, right? I think he's going to win. Um, but me personally, I said like, I will vote for Joe Biden if one thing happens. And that thing did happen. The what? Big Ten college football season got canceled. Oh, okay. <laughs> so I'm an Ohio State guy, right? This is supposed to be our best team ever. Okay. Um, but what? But the whole thing of it. But I, obviously, they got canceled because of coronavirus, right? I want to get your guys' take on this because you know you were um, again. This one of the things you guys took heat on was the handling of Corona and COVID nineteen, right? Um, so to me, um, I get that the states had their own individual ways to handle things, right? That's the way our government is set up. But to me, it's like. I still feel like the Corona situation in the United States has been, my, my wife's a physician. She's a physician at, um, in the Southwest side of Chicago. Um, so, you know, got some insight on, how, on what's going on there, but like m my take, it seems to be that the United States handle coronavirus a little, not as they should have, so to speak, compared to other countries. Right. And could, because of that, and I think that's part of Trump's rhetoric, even though he like maybe the policies himself didn't like affect it. And I don't have a Buckeye season now because of that. And, um, hey, man, like, you got what you got to do. I, 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 need, I used to have a boss that would be like, when the results, when the job doesn't get done, you need a throat to choke. Yeah. Right? Joe Biden's not the president right now. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, but, but I, I want to get your guys' take on COVID-19 and, like, I know some of the flack you guys have gotten for that and, like, how um, people are approaching it. W what parts of it are you thinking, like, we're going overboard on, et cetera, if you want to go there? I'll just give the two second church thing and I'll let Jose talk. Sorry, sure. brother, I'm taking off Jose's time here. Uh, real quick, we all shut down. Nobody knew. We didn't know what we didn't know. After a month, we began to know what, what we find out now that it, it, it sadly discriminates against those with preconditions and the elderly. And so generally, the healthy do fine. Uh, the testing sites were up. I was also tracking at the Restore Illinois page that the hospital beds were open. The ventilators were open and uh, our governor had not made us essential which he's obligated to do and so we had to push back and it went all the way to the supreme court not with our church's name but a church that we were collaborating with that they're also non-denominational pentecostal church the elam romanian pentecostal church to be specific and we got the governor to drop all restrictions so now it is a choice of the conscience for uh, any religious organization, including your mosque or uh, any temples in the area. That's how we look at it. But now, as more time has come out, you look at the European model, the ways where they did more strict, Italy, Spain, et cetera, they did really bad, where they had more of an open concept. Sweden, uh, I believe Switzerland, Holland, Finland, a few others did really good. Um, and what, what they think the difference is, is how they treated the elderly, how well they could stop it among the old. If they could stop it among the old, there was less deaths. And if they didn't do such a good job, like in Italy, they waited way too long in the nursing homes, as well as in New York, that the deaths were really high. But uh, that's how we looked at it. It wasn't really necessarily a religious uh, per se issue, like in the Bible. It was just a constitutional issue that we felt they were violating in our religion. So it's like our religion is afforded this by the constitution. We're asking you to give it to us. And yes, we are a federalized uh, democracy, so each state uh, has its own uh, government. So we had to fight against the Illinois government. Gotcha. Yeah, Jose, did you want to add to that? Oh, and by the way, Jose never worked at Nini's, or at least not in the future, maybe as a kid he did, and he never went to Nini's with COVID. That was such a stupid thing they spread about us. That was... Yeah, oh. I wanted to talk about that really quickly just to clarify that. Sure. So I was... I, I was a PE teacher, gym teacher at a state-ran facility, um, basically a penitentiary for uh, youth males, young men. Uh, I did contract COVID, 
and I tested positive. I actually tested positive the day after my father passed away, which was Easter. Um, they called me in that. And um, so I tested positive. At that time, I had not worked for Didi's Deli in years. I did little things here and there for like once a month, I would go help out. That's it. Once a month, I had not been there in a while, um, especially with everything going on. I was quarantined. I was following it. Uh, for a while, just like my church. I did whatever our pastor was leading us and feeling God on. So I did not go there for a long weeks before that. Um, yeah, because I was quarantined when it happened. It was April, whatever Easter was, like a week of April, the week of April when I found out. And my job, I'll tell you this, my state-ran facility was allowing me to come back to work faster than the church wanted me to come back to service. <laughs> see that my my state ran facility after finding out i had a positive result let, wanted me to come back in like 10 days and i'm like uh, i don't think that's following protocol yeah so I, at least I, at least two weeks right that's what my doctor said i had to get i had to get a doctor's note to get mm. to my job i need at least two weeks off mm. so and then i tested again negative so and so i've tested positive i, I remember having it for a couple of days this is before i even tested though um, it was like flu for a little couple of days and that was fine. I even went to work. I didn't know at that time, you know, this happened in March when it was first happening. I didn't know I had it. I just thought I had a little, I was tired or something. That's going to feel bad. But anyway, so my thing. Yeah, they, they, I'm sorry to interrupt, but they, oh, the on us were actually saying not to come and our church has been safe this whole time. It's so crazy that they make up lies like that. It's like Pastor Joe was telling me to get tested. And I'm like, bro, I don't want to get tested again. I've already tested negative. But he was more concerned about it in, in, in a godly way, in a healthy way, mm -hmm. than my own job, which is a state-run, state of Illinois-ran facility. Mm -hmm. So I'm just mm -hmm. putting the facts out there, just being honest with you. Sure. And so, you know, that's here's the personal testimony. And Jesus healed me from it. And I've tested negative twice already afterwards. So. Okay. Um, let me ask you about like the mask. Cause I, I saw a Facebook post you said about like these days they want us to wear masks and in the future. They're going to have to wear like a chip, like, like a chip, a monitor, like a, you mean like a monitoring device, right? Um, what's your, like, I, and I've like, so what we know about masks is it, 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 like establish that first. I think most people would agree that the cloth masks that we're wearing, like these right here, they're not, they're only like, if I have symptoms, if, and you like, let's say me, you and Jose and I are hanging out, right? If I've got symptoms, um, my understanding is that it protects you from my symptoms. But if you have symptoms, then it doesn't protect me. It's like only an outgoing thing, right? And even the validity of that is like kind of, it's not the N95s, which are the medical grade ones, which are really hard to get. You shouldn't even be, you shouldn't have them unless you're actually like in healthcare, right? Um, that's what I'm hearing. So most people would say we agree on that. We, we, we agree that the masks are more of a deterrent for, um, for spreading it if you have it yourself. It's not going to protect you. And the idea is that you, since you don't know, everybody wears it. And, if, and then also there's research has shown now that it's generally going to spread if you're symptomatic. If you're asymptomatic and you're positive, you, you're unlikely to spread it as much, right? So people are asking, well, in that case, why do you only make the symptom why don't you only make the symptom symptomatic folks wear it and one of the reasons i've heard is that um because people then won't wear it like, nobody will wear it because they will be feel singled out in a community like we have that kind of community right so that's so that reasoning makes sense to me uh but i want to get your take on the whole masking thing and which we see is probably going to be a way of life maybe the next year as far as like places requiring us to wear masks and whatnot Man, that's a great question, you know, a great topic to bring up. Um, my pastor shared a video about one of those doctors that they blocked saying basically that wearing a mask is almost like throwing sand at a chain link fence. It might stop a little bit, but it's not really gonna do what you think it's gonna do. Um, but even if I wanna, you wanna talk about that post, um, I was referring to this verse in the Bible where it says, Revelation 13, it says, um, verse 15, I go over there. Um, not, you know, let's go to verse 16. It also, talking about wicked governments and wicked people, it also forced all people, great and small, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their hands or on their foreheads so that they could not buy or sell unless they had the mark, which is the name of the beast or the number of its name. I went to a restaurant where I'm at right now, and they didn't even let me eat until I had the mask on 
until they checked off me and my wife's temperature and my head. And I went somewhere else and I think they asked me that. And I said, do you want to check for my chip next? Because the mark they say on the beast is going to be on the, on the arm, on the forehand, probably, or what's the name? Sorry, the hand or the forehand. So I see it, you know, we want better things for America. We want better things for nations, but the Bible says that things are going to get worse. Mm -hmm. So uh, although we want better, we pray for more, for better. We pray for people to become Christians and do things right. We know things are going to get worse and it's going to lead us to what the Bible says here, where people are not even going to be able to eat um, without having this mark, without having mark, it says right here on their right hands or on their foreheads. Mm. So I was sharing the correlation. Uh, Christians would, for the most part, understand that, that, hey, this seems to be something they're trying to condition us mm. to get ready for something. I'm not saying it's going to literally happen tomorrow, yeah. but it seems like they're trying to condition us for it. I felt it personally when they wouldn't even let me do something without, I went to get, I forgot what I went to get glasses for my wife and they were asking me things like that. And I went to a gym, <laughs> they're asking, I had to take my own temperature mm. to go into a gym just to work out. And the gym I was working out by myself, they won't even let more than one person in. Right. So it's right, right. like they're trying to get us ready for something. I got you. Um, with regards to like politics and stuff, um, like the whole, like I, I've seen Christians pre share. Uh, oh, one question I like. So I texted Juan a couple of days ago and he was like, ask Pastor Joe. And I was like, what? This is a question for you. But like, all right, sure. Um, so I was I asked him on the live stream. Once Nini's has closed, the protesters uh, you had okayed the protesters to, to, to paint the building. Why did you let them? Don't you guys own the building or at least rent the building? Um, I thought I remember you saying your, your dad bought it like back in the day when Noble Square used to be the hood. Okay. I thought you were going to ask Pastor Joe. I'll answer. With you. Sure. Either <laughs> you, answer. whoever. Yeah. Sure. Um, you know, I don't know exactly why my brother allowed that. I'm just being honest with you. I just mm -hmm. remember him saying it. But Joe, did you want to share about it? Can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, the question was um, on the on the live stream. Once it was announced that Nini's was closed, I think that Saturday, right? Um, there was a question of like whether he, Juan would be okay with them painting the restaurant black, and he said, "Yeah, that's fine." The question oh. I had for Juan, I asked him like, "Why did you okay it?" And he says, "Ask Joe on Saturday." <laughs> <laughs> I was like, dude, it's your restaurant. I was like, I was like, I thought I'd ask you, but because I, I was gonna ask you, bring it up on the live stream, and then I was like, oh, they're just gonna ask me, like, ask Juan, man. Yeah. <laughs> one, one, and I probably had one disagreement over this, and I'm kind of embarrassed now because Juan still made his own decisions, but he asked me, uh, how do you think we did with everything? And I said, well, if they're saying this is a time of mourning and we didn't respect their mourning, then let them know we'll respect their mourning now by allowing the, the, the wall to be painted black. And so I think out of respect for me, he went along with that, and now he's saying, ask me. Uh, I, as a pastor, I'm, I'm a peacemaker, you know, working with the community. I don't think Juan would have did it without my advice, but I still want to make sure he owns it. So yeah, Juan, you got to own that. But it's a funny moment between us because... He kind of, I guess, regretted that decision afterward or something. So now I'll let him describe after that. But this is, once again, the difference people don't understand. They actually think I'm the crazy one and Juan's the normal one. I was the one trying to find ways to bring the peace. And Juan was basically just wanting to keep rebuking and, and preaching at them because he was so upset that the friendship was being devolved to that. Then that's the part, honestly, that I was shocked at. Not yourself and others. But like some of the certain people that were out there, like this one guy, he really erupted. He was a black gentleman about the same size as Juan, you know, that's the only way I could describe him. And he got in Juan's face and screamed so loud. And he had like three people around him. I don't know if you remember that. But from that point on, everybody said, because he did it, now we're going to do it. Then everybody started screaming at them. And I'm like, who are these guys? He's like, that's my friend. These are my friends. And I'm like, bro, friends like this, who needs enemies, you know? So I tried to do that peacemaker thing with Juan. I said, man, maybe let him paint the thing black. Because I thought we could come back and have further discussion. But they, they didn't want that. And then that weekend, that's another thing. You know, when you talk about Bevelin and Edme, who are coming down this, this uh, uh, weekend to be, not this Sunday, but next weekend to be with us. 
they thought they were our hired black people or whatever. These people, they have no idea who they are. I'm sure you've tracked with them maybe a little bit, saw them go viral. These people were wild for Jesus and wild politically before I ever met them. I met them because of that and wanted to get their take on what we were doing. But on their own, they came with me. I wanted them to preach because I'm bringing black unity in the church. But they on their own wanted to go to Nini's Deli that Sunday after we had been threatened to have our building burned down, they wanted to go to Nini's and let them all have it because they were upset at what had happened to Nini's. They had met Juan's mother on that Thursday and, and other, you know other people from Nini's. And so they went out there on their own and created that situation. And I actually liked it, but it wasn't approved by me. It wasn't sent by me. It wasn't sent by Juan. I just remember being on the phone and they were like, calling me up because the police were there blocking them off. And they're like, uh, get Juan's number because I want permission to tear down all the stuff they put on the walls. And so we're trying to get a hold of Juan to give them permission because the police weren't going to let them take down those monuments. But then Juan said, yeah, take it down. So because Juan's thing was never graffiti the whole building. It was if, if painting the wall black will show you that we want peace, then do that. But obviously nothing ever meant anything to them. Uh, they weren't rational. It was, it was crazy. So that's why I guess he said, ask me. So sure. there's, there's my mistake. But see, but once again, I'm sorry to interrupt, but think about that. There's yeah. my mistake. Right. I listened to them mm -hmm. and now one says, go ask Joe. So it's like, I made nobody happy on that, you know? Yeah. As, as you guys talk about like the state of the country and um, I, I know Joe, you, you, you kind of illustrated the uh, perspective of the Christian towards politics. Um, one of the things that's been popping up today, again, in this day and age is like the whole standing for the flag or the anthem, right? Um, you know, and I saw a baseball player tweet out, is like the only um, me I take is for Jesus. Um, you know, I don't know if you guys saw that or not. I thought Juan actually said or shared on his Instagram. So I was confused by that because when someone kneels for the flag, they're not kneeling for the flag as like a sign of worship. It's like, you're almost like disrespecting the flag or the anthem, but like, um, but when you see a country go down a, a, this, this path away from your Christian morals, um, wh why are y'all, like, are y'all opposed to, like, people like, standing, like, sitting for the flag or, like, doing that kind of thing, you know? Because wouldn't, couldn't someone say that the flag and the national anthem represents some kind of, like, a state that is deviated, a state that is um, essentially, like, something else that has been worshipped? besides Christ? Yeah, that's a good question. You know, some Christians don't show any uh, patronage. They're not uh, patriots because of that. They would say any allegiance to a state is idolatry. We're not in that branch. We do believe that we should honor God and King, the Bible says in Romans 13. Uh, and, and so for both of our traditions, anytime we take a knee, uh, we have to ask ourselves why. If we're taking it as a seated position or coming down to be comfortable, like you know, in a sporting game, hey, everybody take a knee, let's talk. But the moment a movement or a group of people or an individual and or religion asks us to take a knee, that is idolatry to us. So uh, when you're saying kneeling for the flag, uh, I don't know any Christian that kneels for the flag. I don't know if you meant they're kneeling and still respecting the flag, but we don't, I wouldn't bow to the flag either. I guess I kneeling during the anthem. When the anthem is played, they're kneeling, right? So the that, protesters. Right, the protesters. And so now you yeah. see the NBA players doing it. Um, oh, and this yeah. one, yeah, this, I think the player for the Astros, he's a Christian. He said, I'm not kneeling because yeah. the, only, I only, the only knee I take is for Jesus, right? So exactly. to me, I was just like, I was trying to understand like, but the knee for the, when you kneel for the, and the and during the anthem, you're not respect, it's the knee is to respect the anthem. But I think you're explaining it as that, the knee is not necessarily for the anthem. It's for this movement that we can't get behind, that we disagree with. And that movement is kind of like taking some other deity, whatever, idea, ideology as, a, as, as our worldview. Yeah, but I also wouldn't kneel for the anthem either. I wouldn't like leaving BLM totally out of it. Yeah. If it became a, tr a tradition instead of placing your hand over your heart. Yeah. If it became a tradition to kneel, I wouldn't kneel. So that's where I would draw the line. Mm, okay, I got you, I got you. Makes sense, makes sense. All right, we're coming up almost two hours. Is there anything else you guys wanted to cover, or talk about that we, that we, that we didn't, um, you know, um, that we didn't get to? My whole thing would just be, 
this dialogue, once again, the conversation in the conversation, was what I was hoping would happen after I preached the Thursday on the live feed. But they started putting up porn and kept making death threats. So I feel that, that some of you guys who wish it would have happened, uh, I, I wish that you wouldn't put all the blame on us for being so extreme. I wish you would put, if you're going to at least be honest, put the blame on them as well. Because even after I said all of my extreme beliefs, right, that Thursday, I let anyone come on. And you were even writing me, but it was too late at that point because it, we, the pornography had already come on so much that now if I tried to let you on, it would uh, be looked at bad. And I tried it again Friday, but then it was over, you know, and I, you know, you didn't reach out to me, but I don't think you could have done anything because no, none of you guys had control over that. Like uh, there's individuals that actually got named in cases. And I know that they got brought up on some charges and, and I can't go into more detail. We, we really believe they were the instigators that really drew that crowd. And I wish my final words would be, I wish that that crowd wouldn't uh, taint either one of our relationships. Like I wouldn't let that crowd taint the way I see Christian, the blogger or you or any other customer that maybe has concerns about Christianity, or whatever. And I would ask that they wouldn't let that crowd and all the things they said about us taint the way you see us. Uh, if, and, and maybe one last thing as well. If they wanted to, they could go back there and start meetings. But these brothers actually thought it was a will of God to move them out of the city for their reasons, just like I go back to Juan's call. But I would hope that if, let's say, whatever reason they would start it, that people like yourself would say, hey, let them have a business. If you don't support it, that's fine. But my goodness, let's not threaten them. Let's not stop them. If you don't like it, you don't like it, you know. But I wish that would have happened earlier. But maybe we did play more of a part in that. And I'm still growing and learning. So I pray that I'll grow in the grace of God as others do as well. And yeah, we're all, we're all growing. I appreciate that sentiment, uh, Pastor Joe. Uh, and Jose, any, any final thoughts or anything you wanted to cover before we wrap this sucker up? Yeah, I just want to say, Mike, thanks, man, for having us on. Uh, appreciate it. Appreciate the level of respect you've shown. Um, and just your level of maturity, just being able to talk about it. <laughs> you know, uh, like my pastor said, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to talk to people. And um, I want to just kind of say, man, it seems like, Almost, no, they're even saying it. This is something that's coming. They're trying to bring communism, socialism in the world, in America. If they do that, there's no religion except whatever they want. So they're trying to uproot American values, period. And, and the reason you're here, Mahin, as a Muslim and allowed to be here is because of Judeo-Christian values that allow us to live peacefully with you and tell us to love our, neighbor, love our enemies, even though not that we hate each other in an enemy sense, but as an enemy of God, we would say you're an enemy of God because you're not a Christian, but we still love you and we still believe you should have the right to live and have a family and we can't force our beliefs on you. So very things that we're here for are threatened. And we, we don't want to see that happen because uh, we love America, we love all the nations, but we just love this freedom that God has given us here. And then I would just like to close with this last verse in Acts 26, 29, Paul says this, short time or long, I pray to God that not only you, but all who are listening, to me today will become what I am. So my, our, our desire, friend, also we want a great things for America, is for everyone to become a Christian. We know that's not gonna happen according to Bob, but we want that, we want the desire because like we were talking about earlier, we know that the judgment of God is coming and we want you and everyone else uh, to receive forgiveness for their sins through faith in Jesus Christ. So, thanks again, man, we love you. And uh, I really, really, really from by my heart, bro, I'm so appreciative of you just talking and, uh, uh, just talking back and forth for messenger, it was fun. Yeah, no, no, no doubt, no doubt. Hopefully, we can meet in person at some point. Um, Joe, I, I'd love to like stop by the church at whenever, like you know, is a good time. Uh, if you're there, we can certainly chop it up some more if you want. Um, you know, how could people reach out? No, well, okay, Jose, I'm sure you don't want people. Reach, I'm not gonna. <laughs> I'll ask Joe <laughs> if people want to like reach out to you cordially. Is there a way to do so? Yeah, they can hit us up at info at mpichurch.org, info at metropraiseinternationalchurch.org, MPI Church, or just uh, the new page that we have now on Facebook. We kept the underground page on Facebook because of all the conflict. Basically, they were just going through all of our pictures, looking at the tags and going to all the HR departments. So we had to relaunch those things. And a good, a good news about this is, is the Riascos are about ready to announce the new things that they're doing because they are doing ministry. They're going to start announcing it more and they're going to let the law protect them and God as well, because they're tired of uh, living like that in the shadows as well. They shouldn't have to. 
and uh, they'll be coming out soon. So thank you again. Well, cool. Look, looking forward to it. Can, that... I, say one, can sure. I say one thing? Sorry, yeah. you. Um, they can, I don't have no problem people contacting me. You contact me on Facebook, Twitter, with my name, Jose okay. Vesco III. Okay. Um, if, if they want to talk like this, like, no problem, man. If they're acting crazy, swearing, you know, they yeah. get the block. They get the block real fast. I don't give much time to them. But yeah, I would love to connect with people and even Muslims who want to talk about the faith or anyone. Man. Right, be, right. Yeah, it, you're right. Personally, I've always been a, like, I know we've talked a little bit. I, I don't like, I, you know, just to be clear, I don't talk about um, religion in a sense, uh, like on Messenger, personally. Like, like you know, we, you saw a little bit of interaction. I'm uh, like a, a little bit about my, I guess we can maybe like, I'll, I'll share this a little bit. I... I've always viewed myself as a Muslim with some kind of, with an interest in Christianity, I, like an academic point of view, right? But I'm not like a, like a scholar of Christianity. I haven't read the whole Bible. I've read like the four gospels, like I told you, right? Um, familiar with like the book of Revelation. Um, Cause I think that's something that when you look at the Quran, when you look at Islam, you kind of like are interested in seeing like the other revelations as well, like what people have, right? Um, so I took a church uh, a course a couple years ago, which essentially is um, a, a, church, a class at a church two years ago on the west side of Chicago, about 10 weeks. Because um, essentially, my whole, this whole podcast is about trying to understand why do people believe what they believe? Like, what's their worldview? Why? Um, and that can, religion, it can be religion, it can be politics, it can be whatever, even stuff I disagree with, right? For example, there, there's an episode um, with a transgender individual that I've done that hasn't aired yet. Um, that I know people have been waiting on, um, chomping their bits for, but like trying to understand like what happened, like what's going on. Uh, but that what I learned, but that's what was my takeaways from that, from attending that church for 10 weeks was that like, okay, now I understood because I had preconceived notions about what Christianity was or what I thought the Trinity was. Um, I was like, okay, so now it's like, okay, now I understand what you believe. I, I understand why you, but like now it's like, why do you believe it? And so like in every person, I mean something different, right? So that's the whole like, but I, I like these conversations over Zoom. If you want to jump on Zoom and things like that, we could talk. Messenger just isn't like how I personally do it. Um, it, it, it just not my cup of tea. Cause sometimes like you're in the middle of something and like, obviously these are very important questions. These, these are, as you mentioned, issues of salvation. Um, you know, I'm cooking fish on the grill or something. And then like, if I get detracted, that fish is going to burn. So. <laughs> <laughs> or worse the house does if you don't if you're not careful but yeah man appreciate y'all coming on um for our listeners out there um you have any questions or comments you can email me at info at sultansandsneakers.com follow me on facebook twitter uh, instagram we're on apple podcasts uh, pocket cast google podcast stitcher and youtube so um for my special guests pastor joe wyrostic from Metro Place International and Jose Riesco III. I'm your host, Mahinda Pastor, signing off for Sultans and Sneakers.